welcome to today's uh, AFAN webinar, and uh, uh, hopefully you're going to enjoy today's uh, program. So today we have uh, one of our own members who's going to present on our uh, approach to uh, brain CT scan, and that is Bejo, uh, who is a medical student from uh, Cameroon. So he's going to introduce himself, but before he begins the presentation, I'm going to ask everyone to introduce themselves. Uh, I'm going to be calling out names as uh, they appear here on my screen. So I'm going to start with uh, Michael. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Damimore. I am a fourth year medical student at Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine here in the United States. I was originally born in Nigeria. I actually came to the U.S. when I was 13. Um, I've always been interested in uh, pursuing a career in neurosurgery, uh, mostly because of the, you know, as we all know, deficit of neurosurgeons in Africa. And one of my biggest goals is that after training, I'll be able to come back to uh, Nigeria and also be able to institute, you know, programs where we can actually try to help train neurosurgeons in, in Nigeria and other parts of Africa as well. And I feel like the best place to start is, you know, getting to know everyone. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, you're welcome to Afan once again. Um, next, we have uh, Celestine. Celestine, please, you can introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. I'm Celestin Bilong, fifth year medical student from the Faculty of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at the University of Yaoundé, One Cameroon. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Celestin. Then next we have Dr. Daniel. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Daniel Safarin Teranya, a medical doctor from Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, I'm actually um, uh, working in, at University Clinics of Bukavu in the surgery department, and equally as a research assistant at the Forensic, at the forensic Center uh, uh, at your official University of Bukavu, um, equally um, research uh, fellow of FN. It's a pleasure to be with you all this evening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Daniel, and it's uh, good to have you here. Next, we have uh, Crescentia. Good evening, everyone. My name is Crescentia. I'm in a fifth year medical student in Russia, but I'm from Tanzania. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you so much, Crescentia. Then next, we have uh, Olalua Ezekiel. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. I am Olalua Ezekiel Dadar. I'm a second year medical student from the University of Baden, Nigeria. Glad to be here. Thank you so much, Ezekiel. Then next we have uh, Lauren. Please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lorenzo Sobapel. I'm a third year medical student in the University of Baden. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Lauren. Next we have Dr. Oric. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Ulrich Sidney, founding president of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. Um, glad to be here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Oric. And uh, lastly, my name is Darwin Schimba. I'm a medical student from Copper Belt and Visit School of Medicine in Zambia. And I'm the director of operations for the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. So like I said earlier on, we are privileged today to have our own uh, member. Uh, to present an approach, uh, approach to uh, brain CT scan. And I'm going to call upon him to introduce himself and uh, begin the presentation. Uh, Bejo, over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Darwin. Uh, greetings, everyone. I'm called uh, Takutsin Dogmo Bejo, currently a CTA medical student of the University of Boya in Cameroon and a member of IFAN. So I don't know, Darwin, can I start sharing my screen? Uh, you can go ahead, please. OK, thank you. Uh, OK, uh, thank you once more, Darwin. OK, today I'm going to present uh, the approach to head CT scan. So for this uh, 
presentation, we are going to follow the, we are going to use the following outline, introduction to city and brain city, generalities on brain city, brain anatomy on city, steps in interpreting a head city, case, some case presentations, conclusions, references, bibliography, questions and comments. So generally, a CT, which means a computer tomographic uh, scan, is one of the imaging techniques, which is very important, especially in the field of uh, neurosciences, that is no neurology and uh, neurosurgery. And it's commonly one of the basic uh, uh, imaging in investigation requested by, by neurosurgeons to ease diagnosis and uh, prepare the patient for, uh, for an OP. So uh, for a, a CT, a CT the, the technique is, is simply, it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy something. It simply consists of a collimated X-ray, which come from the X-ray tube, as you can see here, which are projected towards a patient and a detector just uh, takes them and the image is now, is now it's being projected on a, on a screen on a computer. Though it's a very useful uh, imaging investigation, but it is usually unavailable in resource-limited countries. For example, a, a research done by uh, Kanmunye or Rick Sidney et al. in 2020, published in the Iranian Journal of Neurosurgery, uh, reported that there were just 1.16 CT scans for every 1 million inhabitants of Cameroon. So this figure shows that the, this resource is really unavailable in low resource countries. So talking about the, the brain CT is simply a tomographic examination of the brain and the surrounding structures, not only the brain. It's true we say brain CT, but it does not mean that yeah, it's only the brain involved. We talk about the brain and the structures that surround it. There are, there are, there are basically two types of uh, computer tomographic scan. You have a non-contrast CT and a contrast CT. Now, when, uh, whenever they, uh, they give you a, a and, and it's, 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 it's tight to, inter to interpret because the, the first thing that most of the time you have to look on uh, to, to, to look is to, to look and determine whether this uh, imaging is it done with contrast or non-contrast. As you can see on this uh, image here, you see that the circle of release is well represented here. So, so that's one of the basic things that, that will help you to know that this image is done with contrast. Because as you can see here, here there's no representation of the Circle of release, meaning that here is a non-contrast CT scan, whereas here and down here, we talk about a contrast CT scan. Since you can see here, the circle of release is well represented. For um, prior to performing a CT scan on a, on a patient, most of the time there is no uh, preparation actually required, but nevertheless, there are some few exceptions. Like, uh, for, like for example, if you have a, a uh, a patient um, who needs a contrast, who needs contrast CT, most of the time you have to uh, ask the patient to stay some few hours without eating as his fasting, and you you might want to uh, you might request kidney function tests. And those 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 of patients who uh, usually you have to like prepare them, they also include let's say patients who maybe. Uh, Let's say a patient who has claustrophobia, like a patient cannot stay in a closed compartment. So that, for that patient, you have to give that patient maybe a, sed a sedative agent or anesthesia. And for you to give it, you have to do a like kind of a a, a, a walk up so as to make sure that everything is fine before you go into the procedure. Now, as contraindications to a contrast city, like you, you can have a patient who presents at the ER with a head trauma, patient with a CVA, a patient who has a poor kidney function test, or a patient who has a proven allergy to the contrast. So for the product of patient, the contrast it is contraindicated. Now, for you to interpret a city, you must first of all know, because most of us, most of us, we commonly know only of the, uh, the, 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 this, this exact plane, the, and this exact plane, whereas they are, they are other, they are different other planes, because when you talk about a plane, it's simply, uh, it's, it's, it's simply a presentation on how you view the, the the imaging like here on the axial uh, on the axial plane it's like you are viewing the brain from from, from above now here you here, here you also have uh, the coronal coronal plane as if you are viewing the the brain from from in front and here you have the sagittal plane which uh, which represents uh, imaging as if you are viewing the brain from the from the side
after determining the uh, the different planes, you also need to determine the ventricular levels. Many ventricular levels exist, but the TV like like we said as references, you have the supraventricular level, the ventricular level, and the and the uh, you have the supraventricular level, the ventricular level, and the infraventricular level. Now here we talk about the supraventricular level. Here at the supraventricular level, as you can see on, the Im on this imaging here, there, there are no ventricles represented. And this uh, level is best when you want to determine the uh, uh, gray-white gray matter differentiation. And it's also the, uh, one of the best level when you want to, to assess for brain atrophy in a patient. Now here yeah, we talk about the ventricular level. At the, at the ventricular level, you, you, you can have the ventricles well represented there because one uh, the thing that will make you know okay that okay this is the ventricular level is is usually the presence of the lateral ventricles which are here, and in some cases you also have the third the, the third ventricles and and the other systems which are well represented. Now the infraventricular level, the infraventricular level most of the time is used when you want to assess a posterior fossa pathology because here yeah, you, you you can start the infraventricular level most of the times it will it will show structures of the of the skull base. Like for example, here yeah, you have here yeah, the foot ventricle, which is kind of the hallmark. Like once you see a, a slide which has the foot ventricle that is represented as here, you know that this level is the infraventricular level. Also, the thing that also makes you know that it's an infraventricular level, you have the basal skull structures. Like here, you have the the mastoid process of the petrous part of the temporal bone, and uh, these other uh, bony structures. Now we are going now into windows. A window is a window simply said is simply like a way to uh, make a particular structure of the brain to be very much appreciated. Like for example, you want to assess a, a patient with a which you, which are suspecting a, a fracture. You will not go and uh, ask for a for a for a brain window. You you, you instead go and ask for a CT for a, 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 a city bone window, because with a city bone window, the, the, skull, the skull is is well is well appreciated there compared to the other windows. The same thing, if in case you have a patient with a sub in which you are suspecting a subdural hematoma, the best window will be a subdural, a subdural window in which you can have the subdural uh, hematoma well appreciated there. So here you have the, so here you have the bony window, here you have the brain window, here you have the subdural window. Other windows uh, exist, such as the soft, soft tissue window and even the, the stroke window. Now, we talked initially on how the CT scan works. Like that is, uh, you have collimated X-rays which are projected upon a person, and the detector catch, uh, detects them and send now a, a, an image on the on the screen of the computer. Now, that ability of the different body structures. To, uh, to, to, to block or absorb the X-ray which passes through them is called attenuation. And based on that degree of attenuation, different structures will have different uh, colors, colors, colors on the on the on the on on, on, on imaging. And uh, those uh, those different colors we term them here yeah, densities. Like for example, when you talk about the radiography, you talk about opacities and translucencies. When when you talk about when you're talking about the MRI, you talk about the intensities. Whereas when is when you're talking about a CT scan, you talk about the densities. And those uh, different attenuations are represented in the unit called the Hounsfi unit. And with, with the with the lowest attenuation, uh, with the lowest value being the that of air and the highest value being that of the bone. And as you can see here, you see that. Air, which uh, attenuates less, is darker, which is hypodense. Whereas when you have bone here, which which attenuates more, it's uh, is white compared to the other one. So you see that here, there's kind of a an increase in the density as you go along from the air to the bone. So here you can have the different the different attenuations: calcium, acute uh, acute bleeding, gray matter. They are all hyper, uh, hyperdense on CT scan. The white matters, isodens, CSF fat, and air are all hypodense. Now, in the, the indications of a, a brain CT, there are a lot of them. So you can have hydrocephalus, brain abscess, tumors, etc. 
Now, now, now we'll talk about the NICE guidelines for a CT scan, which is a, one of the um, most commonly used guidelines for, for, for a patient who comes at the ER for you to request uh, a CT scan. So here we'll first of all discuss about the, uh, the guideline for, for adults. So here you have a patient, if, in case of a patient that presents with a GCS score of less than 13, with first assessment at the, at the department, at the emergency department, this patient requires a CT scan done as soon as possible. The same thing, a patient with GCS less than 15, for about two hours after injury, the same thing, a patient who, who is suspected having a, an open or a depressed core fracture, you do it. Or a patient who has signs of basal core fractures, that's a hemotempanum, panda eyes, rhinorrhea, um, and the otoria, you, the, the patient is the same as the patient who, who has a uh, focal neurological deficit. The same thing too for, for pediatric patients. You study if you have a, 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 a pediatric patient which witness loss of consciousness lasting more than five minutes or amnesia with, with the same duration, this patient requires a scan so, so that we we'll assess what is happening there in the brain. Or a patient who has abnormal drowsiness, projector, projector vomit, uh, vomiting of three or more times, or you have a a post-traumatic seizure, but with no issue of epilepsy, that this patient requires a CT scan being done. Like for example, if you have a patient that comes at the, at the emergency room with seizures, let's like say a patient with seizures, maybe febrile or non-febrile, of course, you, you might want to, to, to do a, a, a lumbar tap to know maybe it's, it's the meningitis because there's the, the law is a patient with fever, a, a pediatric patient with fever, seizures, it's meningitis on the proof otherwise. So here, the part of the seizure, the seizure. It's true. Uh, the main, the main aim of this uh, presentation today is to, is to like know the approach on how to interpret the CT scan, but. A prerequisite that is something that is very crucial for uh, before you jump into interpreting this can still want to know the, uh, that is what is normal, like what is normal, what are the modalities, etc. So uh, in uh, doing this uh, part of brain anatomy and scan, we use uh, different modalities. You have hypodense, hyperdense, and isodense. We we'll talk about high and hypodense as we saw on the the different at uh, different attenuations. It's, it simply means that. Uh, the, the density there is lower, is lower than that of green. As you can see here, you see it's, it's dark. So anything that you see dark on this on the city is a hypodense, it's a, it's a hypodense structure, a hypodense lesion, depending on whatsoever it is. Anything you see high uh, for hyperdense lesion is anything that you see white, as you can see here. You see that here is whiter compared to the green. So that's why we talk, we're talking about the hyperdense lesion. Now, here you have an, uh, the, uh, also an isodense lesion. That is, it is the same density as that of the brain. Let's see, for example, please, let's uh, look closely here. You will see here that, because here, you see that, yeah. If you compare here and here, you see that they are the same. Like, you have the sulci, that is those small, small uh, black, uh, black bars and surrounding, you have some white, white, Areas the same year, so it means that there's kind of a so it's like this there's there's kind of something here the process happening here which is pushing which is pushing the brain this way so it's, and and as you can see this lesion here which is a probably a subacute uh, subdural hematoma is of the same density as that of the brain so so that's what I mean by an acidense lesion. Now let's talk a little bit about the skull bones and sutures. As for the bones, uh, basically on a CT scan, the bones that you, you will easily appreciate on, scan, on, on a CT scan, you have the frontal bones, the, pari uh, the frontal bone, the parietal bones, occipital, edmoid, sphenoid, and temporal bones. The same thing also, you, 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 uh, you will also be able to appreciate the different sutures, which are actually places where two bones inter join together or interconnect. And, here you have the coronal, uh, coronal so structures, you have the sagittal lambdoid, squamosal, and the metopic structures. So as you can see, here, here you have the squamosal structure, which is uh, found between the, the squamous part of the temporal bone here and the parietal bone. 
Here you have the lamb lambdoid structure, which are two of them, which is found between the pyrethral bone in front here and the occipital bone behind here. You have the corona structure, which is found between the pyrethral bone here and the frontal bone here. And you, as you can see, there's a small piece which we call the terion, which is a, a terion, which is the thinnest part of the skull. At that, at that area, you have uh, four bones which meet together. You have the, the frontal bone, you have the pyrethral bone, you have the foremost part of the temporal bone, and you have the sternal process, which is actually inside. So I mentioned earlier about the metopic structure. Met the metopic structure, uh, they are not often, it's, 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 it's not like very common in adults, but it can, be, it can be present in adults. The metopic structures are usually present, but in, in children or let me say units. And as you can see here, the metopic structure here is found between that is it separates the frontal the frontal bones in mostly in children, but it can persist in adulthood. Now you can see on this image here, you can see the a representation of just of a small part of the skull. Yeah, here, here you can have this. Here you can appreciate the structure here. You can have the you can see the outer plate, you can see the inner plate, and you have the deep plate in between and here up. Of course, here is the scalp. So this is a 3D reconstruction because when you do a brain CT, you have uh, those slides that, that you saw, those that are dark and white, they're actually 2D images. But now when you take all of the 2D images at different um, different sections, you can reconstruct them and form a 3D image here. So you can actually appreciate it here. You have the metopic structures, coronal structure. Now, you're talking about the skull bones, as you can see here, you see that here we are at the level of the, we are the infraventricular level. That is the, the level where you can actually appreciate the, the, the skull base. Here you can have the maspate ulcers here. You can have the phenoid sinus here. Got just, it's just to compare with this image here. You can put two images so that you can, so that we can easily compare. So you have the spinal sinuses here. Here you have the zygomatic process here. So still talking about the skull bones, you, uh, the skull bones here, you can have the, as you can see here, you have the different fossae. You have the posterior cranial fossa, which uh, accommodates the cerebellum. You have the middle cranial fossa, which accommodates the, mostly the temporal lobe. And you have the anterior cranial fossa, which accommodates mainly the frontal lobe. Now, you, as you can see here, you have the, the, the maxillary air sinuses. Uh, yeah, the maxillary air sinuses, you see it's dark, meaning that there's air inside. It's a hypodentation air. But you, as you can see, the opposite one, because when you always uh, look on this slide on the CT, it's always good to look both sides to check for symmetry. You can see here that there's kind of a thickening here, huh? like a density here. And most of the time, this is very common in patients who have uh, uh, sinusitis. Yeah, 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 sinusitis. Now, let's talk a, bit, a little bit about the meninges. So, the meninges, as we all know, there are three of them. From um, superficial to deep, you have the dura mater to the pia mater. And uh, not only that, the, uh, you, you can also have a situation where you, uh, you have the you have thickened infodines of the meninges, which, which form what we call the fast cere cerebri and the tentorium cerebri, the cerebelli, as you can see here. Yeah, you, this white, this white, this white area here, this white area here, you have the the uh, the fast cerebri. And here you can see where you can see it's dark. You can see it's dark. Here is dark. Here is dark. This dark area simply represents fluid or let me say water. And the, the fluid here we are talking about the CSF here. So so here's a CSF on the on the brain city. And here you can have the pure matter here, the dry matter here. So it means that like let's say in, in case you, are, you have a patient that you are suspecting a uh, Stop another hemorrhage, like the patient comes with classic presentation of another hemorrhage. What the, 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 the main place like that you must check is to check this piece. This has changed the color from black here yeah, to white. Because if it's white, then you think that there's blood in there at the level of the meninges or in the subarachnoid space. Still talking about the meninges here, yeah, you can have the tentorium, the rebella, yeah, the tentorium, yeah, you have the, 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 the now, I want you to keenly observe here. You see that here, here is a yeah. But you see that the, the density here, 
just to exhibit this hyperdense, but not that much. But when you come here now, you see that it, there's really hyperdense. When you see something like that, and you, just, you, have, you suspect a top of hemorrhage because it's very common with that. Now, talking about the fast, uh, the fast, the fast cerebri is very, it's a very important structure, especially when you want to, uh, when you are suspecting or when you are looking for space occupying lesions, in the brain. The fast, like the fast cell, like helps you to know the midline, the midline, uh, because I see it in the middle. So if maybe you have an institution where you have a CT scan, you see the fat that comes here like just like that, then you think that okay, there's something pushing the the fat to to one side. And in that case, we talk about uh, the the term is is a midline shift, or you can say mass effect to a particular side. Is it right, or is it the the, the left? At the same time, so if there's also, there's also a hemorrhage too, this fat too, the the density too will also increase. And also, not forgetting the fast has a very important function. Like for example, if you have a patient with a brain uh, brain tumor on one side of the cerebral hemisphere, this fast, like since it's sticking and is well anchored to the inner inner table of the skull, it prevents the like prevent metastasis from one hemisphere to another. That's why it's it's, it's much more easier for a, for a, for, a, for a, let's say brain CT to leave, but passing through the corpus callosum to reach the, the other hemisphere. So as you can see, here you have the tension. So seeing this image here, uh, I just want to just talk about the, the aspect of uh, supra, uh, supratentorial lesions and infratentorial lesions. So it means that it is this, the interim cerebrality that helps us to differentiate, like to demarcate that, okay, this is a, if maybe there's a pathology here, this, that, that, that pathology is, is in the supratentorium, where if there's a pathology here, it's in the infratentorium. So, and not, not forgetting this, uh, this um, for, for this image here, yeah, this is uh, a, corona, a, a corona plane, because here you are seeing the brain as if you are standing in front of the person seeing it straight. So, Now we we'll talk about the CSF uh, spaces, that is spaces which contain the cerebrospinal fluid, and they are also called the uh, extra axial spaces. So the spaces like that is the brain, the brain is called the, the axial space, whereas now the, so the, that, is the, that is what surrounds, that is the spaces occupied by, CF, by CSF fluid, by, by CSF, it's called the extra axial spaces. So, and the, those uh, spaces include the soul side, the fissures, basal systems, and the ventricles. So you can see here, there you have the, Cilia fissures here, which is the same here. You have the, the cilia fissures, and you have the interhemispheric fissure, and which in the middle of the interhemispheric fissure, you have the fat that passes through it. You also have the, the yeah, see the interhemispheric fissure down here, where represented. Now, for the other uh, extra extra spaces, you have uh, the you have the the, the ventricles, as you can see here, and as what you see here is not actually a pathology, it's kind of, a, it's, it's, a calf, it's a classification of the coil plexus. You can even appreciate the, the coil plexus a bit here. It classifies. And the, as we all know, the coil plexus is, 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 is the structure involved in the production of CSF with the level of the ventricle. Now, talk, talk a little bit about the, the, the see about the, the extra other spaces you can see half here, the lateral ventricles. Here you have the basal systems. Here you have the third ventricles, which is typically on a CT scan, it is slit shape, slit shape. Yeah, yeah, slit shape. Yeah, it's the, the third ventricle. And the, the third ventricle is uh, found like the third ventricle, the, the third ventricle, the lateral ventricle, they are found at the Ventricular level on on the, on the CT scan, and you can see here the small the small areas here, small areas, small here, yeah, yeah. the the uh, the foramina of uh, of Monroe, which connects the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle. Yes, still you still have the cisterns here, and this cistern here, this cistern here is the supercellular system, which is uh, typically uh, star-shaped. And here you have the foot ventricle, which 
invented here, which is a, 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 as the shape of an inverted. So now talking about the brain parenchyma, that is the brain parenchyma proper. The brain parenchyma you have uh, is divided into like two, two separate areas. You have the gray matter outside and the white matter inside. Like, but yeah, when you see this diagram, because when you hear white, you're expecting something there. Shorter, which is invented white on the CT scan, but unfortunately, yeah, or let me not say, unfortunately, yeah, you have a structure which is actually dark, and yeah, whereas the, the gray matter here is gray. So, the reason being that the white matter, the white matter contains a lot of uh, myelin, ax myelinated axons, and we all know that myelin is, is, is fat, it's lipid. And the and lipid structures are represented with the with the, with hypodensities on the scan. So that so that explains the reason why you have the white matter a little bit darker, and you have the gray matter, which is composed mainly of cell bodies and the, some few axons, which, which is the gray. So now we'll talk about the different sections of the brain parenchyma individually. So first of all, we'll talk about the the gray matter. So at the level of the gray matter, you what you have there, you have the uh, the sulcus and you have the the gyrus or the sulci and the gyri. So the 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 sulci are simply part of the extra axial space, which you can see you can see dark here. That 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 kind of small infodins and in between those infodins, you have the 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 whiter area, which is the the which is the gyri. But now you have this area here. This area, this area, yeah, you call it the insular cortex. I'm sure some of us have heard about an early sign of stroke, which we call the insular ribbon, uh, insular ribbon sign. So when you have a patient that presents to you, maybe with a new onset uh, focal deficit, and maybe maybe the, the patient comes in the first hours after that uh, that uh, clinical presentation, I want to do a CT scan, and this one of these things, one of the one of it is no more, is one of these is absent, like it disappeared. Then in this case, we'll talk about insular ribbon sign, which is an early sign of ischemic stroke. Now let's talk a little bit about the white matter. So the white matter is the part here, yeah, part inside here. So yeah, the, for the white matter, I, a lot of the white matter, you have what we call the basal, uh, basal ganglia. So the basal ganglia is composed basically of two uh, nuclei, which mainly you have the coded nuclei, you have the, and the lentiform nuclei. And you see them here, they're well represented. So just try to compare here, this diagram here, and this one here. So you have the coded nucleus here. That is the head of the coded, the head of the coded nucleus here and here. You have the, the lentiform nucleus, and at level lentiform nucleus, the outer part of the lens form nucleus here, the, the, that is the outer part is the, the putamen and the inner part, the, the inner part is the uh, globus pallidum. So you see that here, when you check here, it's, here it's a bit white, here it's so white. Here is the codate, here is the, you see that in between, it's kind of it's something bending like that. In between, that is what we call the internal capsule. Yeah, those are simply tracks. So, so you have the anterior, Limb, superior limb, and at the junction here you have the genus. So just think about like let's say a lower limb, the upper part here is the thigh, and here is the leg. There's the internal capsule. Now you see that also here I talk I, I talked in the previous slide about the insular cortex. You see that also between this insular cortex here and the edge from there's kind of a small, a small dark something here, small dark passage here. Which even here you can see the dark passage here. That passage is the external capsule. Now, here you have this other white area, the thalamus. And you see in between here, because the, the thalamus in between, the, the thalamus lie on both sides of the third ventricle. As I said earlier, the third ventricle is still like, still like in shape. So here's the third ventricle. It's not well represented here. And, and here you have the anterior horns of the lateral ventricle. Because the, the lateral ventricles, he has both anterior horns and he has posterior horns. Talking about the print pan camera, you have you also have the, the corpus callosum, two parts, you have the genu and you have the stain, and you have the corona radiata surrounding the surrounding the 
ventricles. We can have the so oxygen is in the interior. We have the extra interior area is super interior area is composed of the hemispheres, the hemisphere, and here you have the the Hebelman veins. Now, lastly, to, talking about the anatomy, you have what we call physiologic calcification. So there are structures in the brain that when you see them, you should not panic that, oh, this is a pathology, but something physiological, it's normal. Like, for example, it's very normal for you to see the coil plexus at, uh, like, for a patient with greater than 10 years, it's very, it's, it's uh, very common to see calcified, as, as you can see here. You see here, it's white, there's calcified, there's a couple that's calcified. The same thing for the, for the pinea gland, it's very, it's very, it's very white, it's calcified. You see that it's white almost as the bone, and we all know that the bone contains a lot of calcium, so it's just like, it kind of help you like to compare like okay, this white white way so you get the calcification. The same thing the fast to the dented nuclei too can also calcify it on CT. Now <clears throat> you can see uh, I don't know if it's a physician here, it's a, it's a lab technician. This person here he, he has a, a CT a filming volume. So uh, with this uh, at, at this level now want to start now the interpretation part of this relation proper. And uh, for, as I said earlier, for us to to like to interpret the CT scan in the, the best way, it's so for us to know like the basics of the brain CT and the and the, the normal anatomy or the anatomy of the brain on a CT scan. So at the end of this section now, we'll, we'll be able to actually take a, 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 a an image like this and, and 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 interpret it given the pathology or just or, let, or just saying the this scan is a normal one. So the base that is the most important thing about interpreting a head CT scan is consistency. Like for example, uh, going back to physical examination, uh, it's, uh, it's always recommended that you examine the patient from the head to the toe. Like me personally, what I practice when I examine the patient, I always start from head to toe. Except if maybe I'm in the ER, maybe you know, there are many patients where I'll do a focus examination, but, but in general, I have a consistent plan of approach when I examine the patient. That, will, that helps me not to forget any aspect of the examination. So this the same thing applies here for a head CT. Head CT. Um, and there are various approaches which have been established. There are many of them. But among, among all that, the, the consistency part of it, that is what is the key for interpreting head CT. So when in when interpreting a head CT, you assume that the, the CT slide that is in front of you represents a patient in the anatomical position. That is just assume that you are see that the patient is in front of you in the anatomical position. That is the left of the patient is on your right and the right of the patient is on your left. And you should be able to identify the contrast and versus non-contrast CT, which I mentioned earlier in, in the session. Identify the different windows. Is it a bony window? Is it a brain window? Is it a subdural window, etc. Also identify the levels. Is it the uh, infraventricular, superventricular? And you analyze using the best approach that suits you. Now, here I'll talk about three approaches which are used to interpreting the head CT. You have the what we call the center, center out technique. So the center out technique, what you do is that you start from the middle, that is from at the level of the, the middle that is represented by the first cere the first cerebri, start from the middle and you go outwards. And here, when when I say go outward, you don't just limit yourself. Where the brain is, you go until you, you reach the skull. You cross the skull. You go. You analyze the soft tissues, which which uh, are outer compared to the skull. Reason being that you can have a a, a patient who present maybe with a trauma, and the patient has a, let's say a periosteal hematoma. And if you focus only on like whoa, then let us focus on the brain. Let me forget about the soft tissues which are after the skull, like is the along the scalp. You might miss a an important lesion there. So that's why I, I said initially in this presentation that it's true talking about a brain CT, but actually we, we look the brain together with the surrounding structures. Uh, you also have a uh, problem-oriented problem, problem -oriented approach. So yeah, like a patient presents to you with a thunderclap headache, you examine the patient, the patient has a, a, a serious intracranial, signs of serious intracranial pressure, and yeah, the patient has a, 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 a,
book for the uh, top of agnostic species, the ventricles. Or maybe you have a patient that presents with sudden onset hemi hemiparesis. So what you are looking for on the CT, you are just looking for the for the brain for the brain parenchyma to see there's any ischemic lesion there or there's maybe a bleed in the brain. So that is what this uh, second approach means. Now there's the T-step approach, which is a preferred method and is of great use in the emergency room because with this approach, the likelihood of you missing a lesion there is very is very minimum. So, and for this uh, approach, we use the mnemonic. Blood can be very bad. Uh, please, I don't know. I'm I hope that I'm not, I'm not too fast. You're okay. You're okay. okay. You can continue. Okay. So we use the mnemonic blood can be very bad. So the blood it represents blood. Can represent the systems. B represents brain. Very represents the ventricles. And bad represents the bone. So when we talk about the blood, when we talk about blood, we are talking about uh, most of the time we are talking about is it is it a Acute hemorrhage, which is usually presented bright white on the CT. And uh, that hemorrhage, is it intraparenchymal? Is it uh, extradural? Is it uh, subdural? Is it uh, a bleeding in the CSF spaces? So you, so you look at, 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 uh, at all of that. As you can hear, you can see here, you can have a, you can see a hyperdense lesion here, which represents acute, uh, acute intraparenchymal hemorrhage here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, two weeks later on. You see that the density has reduced and it, it, it's, it's kind of becoming hypodense. And you can see here, uh, two months later, it's, it's, uh, it's no more white as here, but it's now more of a hypodense lesion. The same thing here for this uh, epidural, epidural hematoma you see here with the, with the crescent shape. That is a, oh, a uh, pardon, a, a biconcave shape here. It's, uh, typical of a epidural uh, hematoma, so it's it's by it's by concave here, and you can see that it does not cross. It's like it's, it's limited to a particular area. Is that here? If you check where in front here, at this level here, you have the the coronal suture, and behind here you have the lambda suture. So it's that it does not cross the suture suture lines. So it's limited there. So that is kind of it's now help is okay. This in this an epidural um uh, hem uh okay so you can see here sub arenal hemorrhage you can see here's the supracellular system you see there's densities everywhere wide there there's white there yeah you can you can see the the cesian uh, cesian fissures white everywhere yeah you can see, see the the other systems here is just white and hyperdense, subparanoid hemorrhage. You can even see it everywhere is white, the subparanoid hemorrhage. Yeah, you can see, see hemorrhage here. When, when, when we're talking here previously, we, uh, we agreed that at, at, this, at this level here, that is immediately below the lateral, the anterior horn of the foot ventricle, you have the codit. After it, now you have the Lentiform nucleus of which the the most outer part is the putamen. So you can start here. This 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 area it matches with the putamen. So you have a an intraparenchymal hemorrhage at the level of the putamen of the brain, of the basal ganglia. So here you have uh, intraparenchymal hemorrhage with ventricular overflow. So there's bleeding there. It's entering the ventricles, ventricular overflow. Of similar lesions here you can. It's just here, here it's just to distinguish the acuteness of the hemorrhage. Here you have it's acute, here you have uh, here is, here is a yes, subdural, subacute. You see it's isodense, but it's almost similar, similar densities with the with the brain. Here you have a chronic. Now it becomes hypodense due to hemolysis of the blood. So that's what so so that's what makes it uh, hypodense as uh, time goes on because there's hemolysis. Now we had to see that we talk about blood. Now we're talking now at the level of the can systems. So we talk about the count, we talk about the systems, or to make it easy, you just check for all the spaces in the brain which are occupied by cerebrospinal fluid. So yeah, as yeah, so you come here, you check the, the quadrigeminal system, CVN, so you come up here, you check everything. 
that contains um, CSF. But then I said the most com the most important system because there are many systems, but the most important ones you have the second mesencephalic. Like when you see, when you hear second around mesencephalic around the mesencephalic the the mesencephalic uh, part of the brain that is the around the midbrain. So it's it's usually kind of it's something slides. I'll show it in, in one of the slides. You see it pre they presently present them. You have the supercellular, which I've shown uh, on many occasions in the previous slide, which is star shape, and you have the quadrigemina, which is Y shape, as you can see here. See, it's, it's a part in W shape. And you could you could also have the Sivian fissures. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is it here. You can have the second mesencephalic that is around the missing cephalic area that is around the midbrain. Mesencephalic here. You have the the fourth yeah, ventricle where represented the supracellular system. Okay. Now, now we are at the level of the of blood can B. So now you're level of the B, which is the brain tissue. So when you are looking brain tissue, uh, brain tissue, there are three things you are assessing. You're assessing uh, this brain, the, the brain tissues, are the are the hemispheres symmetric? The gray white matter differentiation, how is it? Is it normal? Is it abnormal? You are looking, is there a midline shift, which uh, you will use mostly the fast cerebral to guide you. And you, you also ask for, are there hyperdensities, are there hypodensities, or even isodense uh, lesions at the level of the brain tissue? So now we're going to the level of the very, which is the ventricles. So at the level of the ventricles, what you, you are looking for is, it, is for uh, dilatation, you're you looking for compression or shifting. And you're also uh, assessing for the hyperdensities of the inner lines of the of the of the ventricles. As you can see on the, on the image, you see that yeah, the the the, the distance here, the, the ventricles here are dilated, and yeah, it shows like gross gross hydrocephalus. You see the frontal horns, so everything is just dilated. So just see this 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 part here. You see, it's kind of normal, but when you see it, there's kind of an enhancement. Yeah, enhancement after contrast. It's simply simple. When you have meningitis, because normally under normal circumstances, uh, the contrast does not cross the blood-brain barrier. But in case you have a meningitis, there is you have inflammation of the meninges. There is an alteration of the blood-brain barrier. So in that case, now you have enhancement of the meninges, as you can see. You see that it's a bit white here. It's, it is hyperdense inside. Yes, as you can see, even here. So that makes you think of a meningitis. Whereas, now, uh, also here, as you can see on the image here, you can have an isodense lesion, yeah, this area here, and an isodense hemangioma. You have, you have low density, that is a hypodense glioma here, and you have a typical hyperdense meningioma. And all of them have obviously mass effects, as you can see. You said the first cerebral is bent on one side. Now we'll talk about the bat, that is blood can be very bad. So now we are dealing with the bat, that is the bones. So at the level of the bones, there are two main things that you are looking for. You're looking for fractures, you're looking for tumors. Yeah, you're looking for fractures, you're looking for tumors. Or you can also add, maybe you're looking for also, how are the air sinuses which are found within the, in between the, the, the plates, the skull plates. So, here, here you see a brain window, like it shows with the brain very well here, but here you see a bone window. So you see that here, you cannot actually appreciate, because for sure there's, there's something here, but you, can, you, don't, you cannot actually appreciate, is there, is there is a swelling, is there is a fracture or what? But when you come in, you can actually identify it's, it's a fractural line where the matrix is. So, so, I'm, so here I'm just trying to emphasize about the importance of windowing, like using the best window depending on what you are finding. So here you can have, here, as you can, very obvious here, you can have a, a depressed skull fracture, and here you, you have your double double uh, density. That is, uh, you have uh, the outer outer plate of the depressed fragment of a line uh, underlining the inner plate of the normal uh, bone of the normal skull. So now. 
at this junction, I'm sure at least that at least we've understood that is the basics, the approach on how to interpret a city. So let's just discuss some uh, few some few cases here. And uh, for this case one, at least I would like that uh, at least someone should kind of identify. So this case one, here you have a 22 year old male who is on immunosuppression therapy for systemic glucose erythematosis, and he presents with seizures. So this is a contrast contrast enhanced CT scan which was done. So this is the, the lesion presented here. So I don't know if one of the panelists can help us like kind of interpret and probably attempt like tell us what is presented on the on the scan present here. Hello. Uh, I try. Okay. Yeah, feel free, feel free. Yeah. Uh, so this is seems like a uh, axial CT cut. Um, we have a ring enhancing lesion uh, in the frontal region of the brain uh, with some uh, midline shift also. Actually, two uh, ring enhancing lesions. And also seems like there's some form of edema in the frontal part of the brain as well, uh, collapsing the uh, ventricles on the, on the, on the right side uh, of the brain. So, okay. yes. so, uh, so for you, uh, so what do you think the lesion is for you? I mean, based on the differential, uh, this patient is on immunosuppression uh, and also seizure presentation. I'm thinking it could be toxoplasma or, uh, or even the CNS lymphoma or something like that. And also because of the ring enhancing lesion. Yeah, yeah, that is, good. that is great. Yeah, it could... It could be talked though, but okay, let me just, uh, okay, first of all, I, I love the interpretation. I was so, so happy by the fact that you mentioned that uh, this is an exercise because that is what is the first thing you identify. Uh, what, what, uh, what, what plane is this? Is it a, is it a axial coronal or a sagittal? So here's an axial. Now, since here, you can have the ventricle represented here. So here, you are supposed to talk also about the level. So here is the, the ventricular level. Now, now interpreting the the scan, as you rightly said, you have two, you have two brain, uh, you have uh, uh, lesions there which are in ring uh, ring enhanced uh, ring enhanced lesions there. You have a a hypodense center, hypodense center, with ring enhancement and whoa, perilesional hypodensity, which represents the edema, and you have here, and you have midline shift, uh, yeah, midline shift to the left, and you also have effacement of the uh, right ventricle here. And this type of lesion is typical for a brain abscess. And uh, when we talk about the brain abscess here, it must not be a pyogenic abscess. So when we talk about brain abscess, it, it can be toxo, as uh, the panelists rightly said here, because uh, toxo is caused, caused by a parasite. And, or it, it could also be a pyogenic abscess, which is caused by a, 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 a bacteria. So let's go to the second one. So here you have- um, a, Can you, Bejo, can you get back to the, to the scan, please? Um, uh, yeah. great, great job, both of you. Um, I, I think it would be helpful if you um, stress the game, what, you underst what, what the, we understand by ring enhancing lesion. I think it's very important to 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 mention that uh, what 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 is the ring? What is the enhancement? What would we okay. see? And uh, just to get back to what you said before. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for the reminder. So the lesion here, you have in the middle there, you have a hypo hypodensity. It simply represents the the abscess or the the area of neck of let's say necrosis. Now the ring that is the white area that that, that surrounds that 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 the dark area, which is the which we, we should talk about, which we, uh, we say ring enhancement is simply the capsule that is the capsule of the abscess which is well vascularized. So when you inject contrast, since it's well vascularized, so it will go and show this uh, this ring this ring present here, and the surrounding now the yeah the surrounding edema caused by the the infection at the level of the brain. I don't know if maybe Dr. Ori will ask something to add again. I don't know. No, just um, um, great job, um, really fantastic job. I'm just going to say that, um, uh, just highlighting what Michael said, 
So when you're going through the, the CT scan and you have a ring enhancing lesion, um, try to think about it the way uh, Michael was deconstructing it. So if you see a ring enhancing lesion, you can think about an abscess, which like Virgil said, can be pyogenic or non-pyogenic. If you think it's pyogenic, then it's bacterial. If you think it's non-pyogenic, it can be toxoplasmosis. In our context, obviously, you know, um, you think about toxoplasmosis if you have a context of immunosuppression, right? Now, on the other hand, exactly like Michael said, think about the CNS lymphoma for ring enhancing lesions. Now, if you're thinking about a CNS lymphoma, then you equally want to uh, watch out for a history of immunosuppression. So for the medical students, at the very least, try and get, keep that in mind. If you see a ring enhancing lesion on one side, could it be an abscess? One, is it superative or, or pyogenic? Is it pyogenic or not? And then two, is it a CNS, CNS or central nervous system lymphoma? That is a primary central nervous system lymphoma. And um, put all together, like Belgio said, well presented and you have all the marks. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ovid. So here you have a second case, a 30 year old African of African descended. He had a colostomy done for an advanced colon CA two years prior to the Prior, for the, prior to this to the presentation, and he presented with a recurring episodes of ir irrational behavior, and the CT scan done revealed this. So I don't know if uh, one of the panelists again will help us, like kind of interpret the scan and maybe give us a possible diagnosis here. Hello, there's no one. I can try again if, if possible. Uh, okay. So this looks like also a axial CT cut. Um, I'm not sure if it's contrast enhanced or not contrast enhanced, uh, but what I do see is that I see a couple of also ringing and Bring that up for all those things I brought. Uh, also, uh, ringing and lesion on both sides of the brain. Uh, we had uh, I, some hypodensity on the predominantly on the left side, posterior side, uh, which could show some edema. Because of this patient's history of colon cancer, uh, this is possible. I'm thinking of metastases uh, in this particular situation uh, that could also cause other episodes, the rest of the behavior. So. Yeah, I. I do think same. I do think same. That's a that, that's a brain metastasis there. So that is based that is based on the history. You, for me, the first thing that comes to my head is the brain metastasis on for, for this CT scan. I don't know, Doctor Eric, do you have any other things to, to say? Something to say? Um, yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, I mean, so I just I'm just going to add here that what what you should be looking out for um, for the panelists is try and take this step by step, okay? So first thing you want to do is you want to describe the lesions. Um, don't, don't be rushing to have like the diagnosis at the end. What Michael has done, what Bejo are doing, it comes from the fact that they've read this a number of times. So first you want to be able to be, com you want to be comfortable with this, okay? So uh, um, really brilliantly described and everything. Just um, adding when Michael asked about uh, knowing what, not knowing exactly if it's um, uh, contrasted or not, you um, you should equally watch out for things like um, dural folds, like the fox. If you look at a fox on this image, you will notice that that fox looks a little bit, yeah, it, it looks, it, it well, it, it looks injected. In some cases, it might be calcified if the patient is old, but if the patient was old, you would find that the, the, the sulci would be much more, um, uh, much more larger, there'll be enlargement of, of those salt size and even the ventricles will be a, a little larger. So you want to watch out for that. Another thing you want to watch out for is just if you're at a level that is like um, almost mm. at, at moidal level, just check out those mucosa around the nasal spaces to see if they, they seem en enhanced or they seem um, uh, injected. So those are a few things that you can just use a few um, tips and tricks that you can use to uh, make sure that uh, you have that uh, that you have that you're you know if it's injected or not. So definitely, um, you have two lesions, right? 
that are at that gray, gray white matter junction, um, you have those two lesions and that context, definitely the first thing you should be thinking about, the very first thing you should be thinking about is um, drop metastasis from the colon cancer. Well done, Michael. And, and really well done, Belgio, bringing up these cases. Okay. Thank you very much for the ad, Dr. Eric. Thank you very much. So let's, let's proceed. Uh, okay. So here you have uh, case, three, case three and four. So here you have a hyperdense lesion with uh, a little bit of a little bit of midline shift, but though it's not uh, very obvious there, you have a, so you have a, a hyperdense lesion, a, a, a layer of the white matter, because you can see that the, the gray matter is kind of spurred here. And uh, this is very uh, typical of, uh, of, uh, of a meningioma. You could also have here, you could also have uh, irregularly, irregularly enhancing uh, hypodensities here, which are kind of typical for high-grade uh, gli uh, glioma, usually a, a glioblastoma, as you can see here. Which are able to get here. Yeah, just going to add a uh, um, Again, good, good, good. Um, highlighting that. So for the meningioma, um, meningioma are, are very vascularized. So when you inject them, they'll they'll, they'll come up really bright, uh, um, as you see there. But more importantly, meningiomas develop from um, the meninges, right? Meningioma. They develop develop from the meninges, and and so you will find them where you have like um, dural dural folds. So you can see clearly that this lesion is uh, growing off of the Fox cerebri. And you can equally see that um, there is what we call the dural tail sign. So if you're looking at the base of implantation, uh, if you look at the base of implantation, you'll find that it has like that continuation between the mass and the dura. So that is the dural tail sign there on both sides. Um, and please, 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 uh, there's this free, free website called Radiopedia. You can visit that. Just type any disease diagnosis. They'll show you CT scans, injected, non-injected, MRIs, and everything. Do that very often, and you'll find that you'll become a lot more comfortable um, with, with this. So, yes, uh, those are things you want to look out for in, in meningiomas. Um, for, for the gliomas, you will find that gliomas are from glial cells, right? The glial cells are the supportive cells of your set of our central nervous systems, because we have the neurons and then we have the glial cells. And in the glial cells, as we all know, uh, if we're at the level of the, the brain, we, we, we know that we'll have astrocytes, the most abundant. We have append, uh, ependymocytes or ependymal cells um, that we'll find um, uh, at the level of uh, the ventricular system. We have um, oligodendroglytes, um, uh, endo oligodendroglyte, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I'm, I'm blanking. So you have these cells that uh, produce myelin, um, and then we have um, at the end, uh, the last one is microglial cells. So we can have pretty much uh, a glioma from each of these different, um, different kinds of cells. But the classification is not, we don't do the classification, classifications anymore around like um, anatomy and histology as we used to. Now it's more biomolecular. So we used to talk about low grade and high grade. I will say things like or, or, um, astrocytoma or uh, xanto astrocytoma and so on and so forth. But now we add those other things. But yet still, you, you need to be able to on a CT scan, on an MRI, better more, better still on an MRI to, to be able to diagnose this. Now, if we're talking about uh, something like a high-grade glioma, high-grade gliomas tend to progress really quickly. Um, um, they tend to, because they're progressing really quickly, what happens is that where they started, that's the center, doesn't get any more vascularization. As a, uh, as a result, it easily dies off and necrosis um, happen. So that is what you see. That that um, hypodensity Berger was showing is actually the necrosis. And you find that the, the surrounding is still viable, getting a lot of blood. So that's why you see that, so that contrast enhancement, the injection. 
So, um, and then obviously because it's growing really quickly and, and modifying the, the surrounding structures, you have that hypodensity of like the perilegional hypodensity, uh, which is uh, again, even for edema, you have to learn the different types of edema, right? You have um, cytotoxic, you have vasogenic and everything, uh, but Bejo's already done a, gr a good job um, describing most of these things. So you want to watch out for this as well. Wow, thank you very much for the answer, Dr. Eric. Uh, actually, I'm the presenter. I've learned a lot, lots, lots. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so now we yeah, are sick K6. Well, basically, the same thing that we really discussed earlier the ring enhancing lesion, brain absence. But the, the reason why I showed, I put this slide is just to kind of put the, the difference between ring enhancement because you, see, you, can, see, you can see a ring enhancement due to brain abscess that due to a glioma. You start for the glioma is thicker, it's thicker compared to the abscess, which is kind of thinner. Okay. Yeah, on this other. Uh, on just, this. just adding there that even the even the uh, the the shape um, abscesses would tend to be almost really round, right? As you can see there, whereas things like um, gliomas will, will tend to be round-ish they're not that like just just compare those two and you find that the one on the left is um, a lot more spherical than yeah the, yeah, the yeah. One on the, yeah the one on the one on the right is a little bit irregular so those are things you're looking out for as well okay now yeah yeah you could also have a lesion so now yeah yeah at this level here you have more of a nodular hyperdense lesion with perilegional edema so yeah yeah, you, you talk about a, 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 a tuberculoma, but just to highlight, even a even a even toxoplasmosis can present with with a similar lesion, not only a tuberculoma, because it's true the common uh, finding on CT scan is the ring enhanced lesion for a for a toxoplasmosis. You could also have a nodular a nodular lesion with the lesional edema. So yeah, you have uh, on this uh, on this on this uh, imaging on this image here, you could have uh, you, you can see various hypodensities they distributed all over the all over the brain parenchyma, and and this and all those uh, with all those uh, hypodensities there you, could, you you can see hyper hyperdensities at this at the center of all those hypodensities there, so those uh, those uh, uh, those hypodensities there is, 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 is simply represent the, the the vesicular stage of a of multiple neurocystic psychosis because that is kind of the, the, the typical presentation of neurocystic psychosis. You have lesions on in the brain, you have multiple lesions in the brain that is that are just scattered in the brain. And yeah, so here at this stage you have the vesicular lesions and, and the, the scoles the scoles are still living inside it. But I bet, I bet at this level here, you, could, you can see that there are more of hyperdense lesions there. So at this level, yeah, the scholars that the uh, the, the scholars they have they have already died, and now you have kind of calcification. So that's why you have this appearance on the brain city. So both of these diagrams uh, represent uh, multiple cerebral uh, neurocystic psychosis. And, they, and for a typical history, the patient will tell the patient will be someone that he, he has a uh, used to consume poorly cooked uh, pork pork meat. That is the, the typical history, or maybe poorly cooked, uh, yeah, mostly poorly cooked uh, uh, cooked pork meat. And is 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 very common in 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 Africa. Like there are, there are areas where they don't cook properly. They have pork cooking methods. Now let's talk a, a little bit about stroke. You can see on the on case nine, this 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 case, this case here. Yeah, you talk about the posterior cerebral artery infarct. At the beginning of the, of the presentation, I talk I, I said ischemia or infarct is represented on the CT as dark. That is hypodense. So this level here, this level behind here, like that, even here, represents the vascular territory. Of the posterior cerebral artery, that is that is the area of the brain which is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. So even if there is an infarct, like a stem infarct, there all of this will be there will be there will be shortage of blood there causing ischemia, which is represented as a hypodense lesion on CT. The same thing, the same thing here. 
Now, yeah, at this, at this level, yeah, let's first of all discuss about and discuss case 11 before going to case 10. So you see that here, you have a hypo dense lesion here. It's still an infarct. So here we, here we are talking about uh, infarct of the middle cerebral artery. But I don't know if maybe some of us have revised the, the vascular distribution of the brain. This, this, this part in front here, this part in front, all of this in front here, is the cerebral, is the vascular territory of the anterior cerebral artery, this area here, including the basal ganglia. Part of the basal ganglia is that of the middle cerebral artery and the one and the one posterior here is that of the posterior cerebral artery. So when so when the middle cerebral artery comes, like it's supplying, it gives an anterior division, posterior division. And for both divisions, you have a, a kind of a superficial branch and a deep branch. But if but if you see an, an ischemia that involves everything that is supplied by the middle cerebral artery, that is the, by, the, by the territory supplied by the, mid, by the middle cerebral artery on one side. So you think of what of precisely is stem infarct. So it's not just, it's not only a middle, a middle um, cerebral artery infarct, but it's a stem that is, that is at, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the base, that is at kind of at the origin of the, of the middle cerebral artery. So that's where there's the, uh, the shortage of blood or the, or the obstruction. Now, coming down to case 10, uh, yeah, you see that both the anterior territory, the territory of the anterior cerebral artery and that of the middle cerebral artery is the ischemia there. So we all know from anatomy that the internal cerebral artery is the one that gives rise to both the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery. So you having an, inf a, so you having a, uh, lesion here, you think of a, of, of a, in fact, by the level of the internal cerebral artery. In most of cases, but it's also possible, it's also possible for you to have both, like the anterior cerebral artery obstructed, the middle cerebral artery obstructed, but what you think first of is the obstruction level of the internal cerebral artery. So here you have ischemia vascular territory of the, of the anterior cerebral artery. Now, here we, let's uh, leave stroke and now come down to case 13 where we talk about the uh, hydrocephalus. Yeah, you, you, you can have that, you can uh, appreciate different dilatations here. You can have the, you can see the frontal horns are dilated. You can see the frontal horns dilated. You can have the third ventricle because normally I said initially that the third ventricle is still like shape, but you see, it's, it's, you can see that it's kind of spherical, I meaning it's dilated. Then you can have the temporal ones, which are also dilated, and you have the foot ventricles dilated. So when you have all the ventricles dilated, yeah, you think of a communicating hydrocephalus because there are two types of hydrocephalus based on whether they communicate or not. You have the communicating or the non communicating hydrocephalus. In this case, the fact that the ventricles, are, all the ventricles are dilated, including the foot ventricle, you think of a communicating hydrocephalus. No. But why is uh, coming back here? But in case, in case this foot ventricle, uh, this, this foot ventricle, if this foot ventricle was kind of a normal, like normal size, normal size, here you talk about a non-communicating hydrocephalus. Because on CT scan, what actually helps you to know? Is it communicating, is it non-communicating? the degree of dilatation of the foot ventricle. And in case the, the foot ventricle is not dilated, you think of a non-communicating and um, most of the time is, is due to an uh, stenosis of the Sivian, Sivian aqueduct or the aqueduct of Sivius. And in case you have a, suppose this CT scan is being done, let's say, let's say in a, in a, in a newborn, yeah, yeah, you would think about a, probably a congenital, Stenosis, whereas if in case maybe it's a pediatric patient, maybe the patient had a history of a, let's say, a intracerebral hemorrhage, maybe with a ventricular overflow, or maybe a meningitis, maybe with complicated by a ventriculitis, you would think of maybe an, an acquired aqueduct stenosis due to scarring of those lesions. Now, also to add, like from Dr. Oric mentioned about uh, the fact that in elderly, in elderly patients, you could have some calcifications. The same thing too goes, if you have maybe an elderly patient and you have uh, ventricles dilated, what you must also try to assess is the level of this of the sulcus. 
how how are they you're supposed to also assess the age of the patient because there's what we call a normal pressure uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is very common in elderly patients or maybe a patient who have uh, a patient with uh, degenerative brain uh, disorders because you, you know there's uh, the, the monolo which says that uh, the cranium is a closed is a closed space which is occupied by by three uh, by comp three components you have the meninges the brain and the css so in case you have atrophy of the brain so there will be kind of an increase in production and decrease in the, in the like the elimination of the CSF fit so as to maintain the same that same volume in the brain and the patient will tend to have dilated ventricles in the on the on CT but but the but the but, but the intracranial pressure there is normal. So I don't know before we go to conclusion I don't know if someone has something to add or Dr. Oric or any other person and add for the cases that I just presented the, the recent ones. Now go ahead and conclude, um, Bejo. Okay, so conclusions. I have six main conclusions. The, the, the brain CT is a very important diagnostic tool. And to add adding to this, we must understand that, uh, like, let's say you, you are in a setting whereby you cannot have a CT scan available. Let's say you have a patient with a suspecting a skull fracture. An alternative to that, even though it, it's not the best, you can just do a an X-ray of the skull. You you can see a. a Fracture depending on the location. If it's well located, you can pick it up on, a, on an X ray. In, in a patient, a suspension, a, let's say a, a hydrocephalus, in, if it's a, a pediatric patient or a, or a, a new need, for sure, in that, in that patient, the, the frontal nerves are still open. So just using an, a, a simple ultrasound, you can actually detect, you, you can actually appreciate the direction of the ventricles on the ultrasound. Now, second conclusion. Uh, the availability of CT scan do very important is limited. Indications and, cont and contraindications need, need to be considered in all circumstances before it is being done. Having a good knowledge of the brain CT uh, anatomy is crucial for you to identify the pathologies because you cannot identify what is abnormal without you first of all knowing what is normal. The key to interpreting a CT scan is consistency. And the best approach, especially in the ER, that is at the emergency room, uh, emergency unit, is using the approach which, uh, uh, which we use using the mnemonic, uh, blood can be very bad. So references the geography. Thanks for listening, everyone. Well, um, well done, Bejo, for uh, this wonderful presentation. Very informative, very clear and uh, uh, very detailed. Um, we're very thankful for uh, being available to present uh, on this session. Uh, I don't know if there's any question uh, from anyone or any addition, I guess. I think that uh, that window was uh, already given by Bejo to people to ask. However, if you have any question or contribution at this point, you can still go ahead and uh, ask your, uh, your question. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say a few things. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it was really a pleasure sitting in and trying to learn uh, some knowledge. Um, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not able to stay till the end. I just wanted to add a few things just to say that uh, there, there's very different things that, you know, the approaches that we use over here and then the approaches that I've learned so far from the way you guys do things over there. I think one of the things that stuck out to me was uh, 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 skull base fractures. One of the ways that you look at it here, we call it raccoon eyes. And I heard earlier someone said pander eyes. So that was like very uh, nice, distinct uh, knowledge for me. So that's first I'm learning that. So, but otherwise, everything was perfect. I love the presentation. I learned a lot today. But thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for that uh, addition. And yeah. Um, Dr. Oric, anything that you're going to say? Yeah, just one word, fantastic. Uh <laughs>